suppose if you were to look back at your proudest moment in your career so far, what would that be? Looking at what has happened since I became governor of Central Bank of Nigeria and up till this time, um, there are so many events that have happened. And when I look back and begin to think about what particular event am I going to regard as one of those proud moments, it's usually very difficult. But I think it's always good to sometimes to look back and say, <clears throat> what were those periods or what were those events that sounded quite insurmountable? There were like challenges at that time. And you thought, how would you surmount them? And suddenly when you begin to, um, to implement some of the actions and you see success of those, then you are happy and they become events that you want to remember for life. I, I give an example. <clears throat> By 2015, when uh, President Muhammad Bari came on board, uh, we had begun to see signs that um, the economy was going to uh, be facing some challenges. During that time, we found out that four main food items, rice, sugar, wheat, and fish, that Nigeria was spending close to about $2.5 billion annually importing those items. And I recall in one of my meetings with Mr. President and I, and uh, during my briefings normally, and um, I was briefing him that, look, we're beginning to see signs of some challenges and that prices of crude was going to come down and it will adversely impact reserves and to some extent also impact for, uh, the exchange rate. And he was very quick in saying, look, what are the items that we really spent dollars importing into the country? And I told him rice, fish, uh, and all these other items. And he said, look, why should we be importing rice when we can produce rice in the country? For me, is that was one that sounded a, bit, a little bit of a challenge, to, so to some extent insurmountable. But looking back today, the fact that right sometime in November, November 18, precisely 2015, he said, Governor, we can surmount this challenge of importing rice and begin to produce rice. Let's go to Kebi State. We went over to Kebi State and we started our rice program in November 2015. At that time, Nigeria was the, one of the largest importers of rice from Thailand, from Venezuela, from India. But today, with all the programs that were put in place, particularly the Ampok and Kobura program, that now straddles about 20, 21 different agricultural products today, I feel happy that Nigeria has become, I mean, has become a country that produces and consumes all its rice products. And this is going to continue into very many other products like you may have also read. Only yesterday, we started our, our wheat program. For the first time, we started our rain-fed wheat program and um, the yields are looking, we, we, we have reports that show that the yields will be very good. And I think this is the way, uh, this is one of the areas that I feel I have my very happy moments because what looked like some challenges, some insurmountable problems became surmountable. And I feel so happy and gratified that this is working. Second, and more recently, is the issue of the digital currency. Digital currency, you know, we've been pursuing a program of financial inclusion. And I know that I had, I had made a commitment that by about this time, uh, the, the level of financial inclusion in Nigeria should have moved almost close to about 80%. Unfortunately, at this time, we're just still about 65, 66, which is still a few points below the 80%. And we felt that in order to further deepen financial inclusion, that Embracing the concept of digital currency through our ENIRA program is something that we needed to. We looked at the whole, we read all the literatures available. We found out that practically no country, even China today is still in its own test program, is still testing it. And we looked around, we found the only set of countries that have embraced ENIRA or digital currency are in the Bahamas. But yet we said we wanted to do it. And again, it looked like one tough challenge because we felt, how could we, um, how could we launch digital currency when major countries, the large economies, have not? Where, where is the guinea pig that we're supposed to learn from? And we found ourselves saying we would do it. And I, again, 
Another challenge surmounted in the sense that only about four weeks ago, we came out very boldly and launched our e-Naira. And this presents Nigeria or positions Nigeria as the first country in Africa and indeed the second country in the world that has launched its own digital currency. So those are some of the things that make me look ha feel happy and I feel that we have the, the President Muhammad Buhari has set excellent legacies that will that will that will live even after he left leaves office. I'm glad you mentioned the e-Naira. It's definitely something that is a historic moment for Nigeria. And in amongst the early excitement, you can see that there's been a whole lot of subscribers, a whole lot of interest in it. There's also been criticisms. And I I just I'd imagine that the consensus among the criticism is that Nigeria already has digital money products that already exist. So in your opinion, how is the e-Naira different or even better to what already exists? Is it, I, don't know, you see, I remain excited by the fact that, I repeat, Nigeria is the first country in Africa to launch its digital currency and the second in the world to launch its digital currency. No doubt, when you have a product of this nature, even where um, people feel that, look, Nigeria is the guinea pig, and we have achieved it, I feel happy about it. Let's not forget that our Inara digital currency is sitting on a first-class payment system infrastructure, which stands among some of the best payment systems in the world today. Okay? Now, if people criticize by, from the standpoint of the fact that, oh, there are other payment systems, the important thing is this. We need to make available to people an array of payment system products that makes life good and comfortable for people. And that is what we are trying to do. But I, I, I tell you, with this Inaira, some of those um, products or uh, payment, payment products that were costly, even both for the banks and even the consumers or bank customers, they, the banks will begin to junk those products and begin to look at embrace newer technology, in this case, the Inaira, that is, I would, I would say, it's certainly cheaper than some of the other payments. But the important thing for us is this, that it affords um, an array of products, payment products, that people can take advantage of, at advantage of for the good of, um, of their business, and they can conduct any kind of business that they wish like uh, uh, um, um, do, do conducting. But of course, Central Bank remains at the background, monitoring the risks and thinking of the best ways to mitigate against those risks. Know that, we know there are risks. Know that, we know that the bad guys are watch, working hard to see how they can break into it. Just, just like in any payment system infrastructure, just like today we talk about cyber crimes and security challenges and the rest of them. So we will take it on and I'm so optimistic that we will succeed here. Early on in the year, you made it known your reservations when it comes to cryptocurrencies, the fact that in your terms, it makes it very easy for criminals to be undiscoverable and it leaves many Nigerians vulnerable to attacks. But I suppose if we look at the timing of that decision, even if we were to speak to Nigerians today, many of them still feel as though that decision came from a malicious place. It's no secret that cryptocurrencies played a, a significant role in the NSARS protests of late last year. And some people would believe that your decision um, seeks to hurt financial, the financial techno, technical, technological space in Nigeria more than it seeks to help it as a direct result of perhaps your personal reservations to the NSARS movement. Would you say that that's true? No, that's very incorrect. Because if you, like you said, uh, the NSARS uh, issues came up um, um, October 2020. And we came up the issue about uh, saying that we will not um, make our banking and payment system space available to those who are, who are involved in cryptocurrency business or those who are the, both those who have the platform or those exchanges or even those who want to do it, conduct them because we feel that a substantial, a substantial portion or percentage of the transactions happening there are illegal, illegal transactions. You look at it this way. What is there to hide? Why is it encrypted? Why are the transactions so hidden that um, if, if I conduct a transaction and, so, and a regulator says he wants to see the nature of the transaction or uh, um, security agency, they want to see the nature of the transaction, those 
cannot be encrypted for people to know what happened. It means there's some 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 high level of illegality that is associated associated with it. NSAS has nothing to do with it. NSAS, of course, people contributed money, and it turned out that um, they, some of some people used their cryptocurrencies or bitcoins to to contribute to NSAS. That hasn't has nothing to do with it. They were only saying that cryptocurrency is a product that is embedded in some level of high level of illegality. And you would imagine that even after we made that pronouncement, practically, in fact, I've not seen, if at all, not more than one or two countries in the entire universe that have supported cryptocurrency. And those countries that have supported cryptocurrency have received serious backlash because it means that within, at the background of the transactions, is that those countries are supporting some kind of level of illegal transactions happening through cryptocurrencies. You will not find in the group of those who are looking at cryptocurrency or central banks looking at crypt- cryptocurrency, you will not find developed economies. You will not find e- economies where high level of uh, uh, high level of payment standards are put in place, where people want to see what is happening, where government uh, money who are after money launderers. You will not find central banks in those in those climes supporting uh, cryptocurrency, and that is the reason we say, and we have no regrets about it. Our decision to say we will not allow those who are dealing in cryptocurrency exchanges or dealing in those transactions, we will not allow them have access to our banking and payment system, payment system infrastructure. We are going to follow it to the letter. We will not allow it to happen. It is clear that you care about Nigeria, that you love this country. Every time we see you, you've got the Nigerian green tie on. So I know it, it, it obviously has a very special feeling towards you. Um, off the back of that, people would say that you have a, in recent years, you've become hyper visible, that we see the CBN governor before we see the Minister of Finance. What do you say to that? The fact that you seem to be everywhere and talking about everything. No, well, I think the truth is this. It's not about looking at who is available, who is anywhere or everywhere. For me, it's an opportunity for me to provide service to serve my country. And, and the passion that I have I've given about 27 years of my career to the private sector. And here was I called upon to come and serve and in fact given an opportunity to, to for, for a 10 year, I use the word tenure, I feel that the country, um, I owe my country a lot. I, I was born, I grew up in Nigeria, I carry a green, a green passport. And when I see how, what the country has metamorphosed from where I was even a youth to where I am today, at my over 60 years, I begin to say, where are we? Where are we going? Listen, Adifemi, I saw this country when Nigeria was good. I was born in Massey Hospital in Lagos. We grew up, even when we go to hospitals, our hospitals were some of, will, will be some of the best hospitals even in Lagos compared to hospitals in any part of the world. I went to school in Lagos. After that, I went to Nsuka to University of Nigeria. We were buying our meals at the university for 50 kobo. 50 kobo. We look forward to going to our refectory every Sunday where you on your plate, you, you, are, you are fed with jollof rice and half a chicken, half a chicken with 50 kobo. You eat, take juice, you do anything. And, and I'm looking at then and comparing it with now. And I'm saying, what has gone wrong? This is where my passion is coming out from. Saying, listen, what role can I play? What role can I play to see how we can correct and, and return Nigeria to where it should be? That is what, let's not forget, Nigeria is a country of over 200 million people. Nigeria is the largest economy in the world. But yet, we, and, and, and we see some of the things we see. Education, health, or infrastructure, some of them are not in the state that we are happy about. And so when people, when you see me saying, I want to intervene in education, I want to intervene in agriculture. I want to intervene 
in power. It's all born out of, um, out of a passion to say, what can I do to return Nigeria to what I grew up to see Nigeria to be? Not because I mean, I'm trying to compete with, for space with anybody. What can I do to return Nigeria's lost glory? Understood. If we look at Nigeria, of course, being the biggest economy on, this con on the African continent, and we look at the challenges that have stifled its reaching, it reaching its potential, I'd imagine that one of the first things that jumps up is definitely the COVID-19 pandemic. So it sort of compounded issues that were already existing. If we look at the pandemic itself, and how it shone a light on Nigeria and Nigerian spending habits. Are there any lessons to be learned? Perhaps if we look at medical tourism, for example, the, the coming of the pandemic meant that people, even if you had the means, you couldn't leave the country. And I, I suppose it raises a twofold question, whether or not the landscape in this country um, services people to the level of quality that they want, and whether or not that is an important aspect of what you seek to do with the time that you have left in this um, in this position. So if we were to look at the COVID-19 pandemic and how it's affected the Nigerian economy, what lessons, if any, do you think have been learned? Again, I talked about what I grew up to know about Nigeria's health system and what the Nigerian health system looks like today. At a point, as a young credit analyst, we were funding pharmaceutical companies that would produce even um, ethical drugs, okay? But it, it got to a point where even Nigeria was importing everything and anything about ethical drugs from different parts of the world, right? Now, Nigeria, I also, I repeat, and pardon that I have to keep repeating my, my past, right? Nigerian medical, even our medical schools, used to be some of the best in the world. People were coming from different parts of Africa, even different parts of the world, to come and study at the University of Ibadan in the medical school. People were coming to Nsuka Medical School. People were coming to University of Lagos Medical School. But today, what, or up, to, up to now, what we find is that people even graduate from Nigeria Medical School, they want to go abroad to practice. We've lost people. At that, even our medical systems are not again in the state that we would think it should be today. So, so many things have gone wrong. Now, here now came COVID-19. COVID-19 became a very serious health fatality for the, global, for the global community. And here we were, even if you are the richest man that could afford to go and pay for any type of medical attention that you wanted to, all countries were locked down. And so you couldn't. And indeed, and, and I can tell you, Nigeria lost very, very prominent people because they couldn't, even though they could afford to go abroad to pay for medical, for medical, uh, medical services, they just couldn't leave the shores of the country for medical, medical attention. So what does that mean? That we must do something to ensure that we improve on our medical facilities in the country. And that is the reason I'm also at the forefront saying, if we have people, credible people, who want to go into the business of setting up health centers, pharmaceutical centers, why shouldn't we access them? Why shouldn't we make it possible for them to access long-term loan at single digit interest rates for them to go into this business? You will, any businessman you talk to about cost of finance before now will say, look, the only problem he has is that he wants to do business. But the cost of finance is high because banks were lending money at, that is, if they can find the long-term finance, they were lending money at has 30%. And the businessman, even in this case medical, will tell you there's no how he's going to be able to service his loan at 30%. And that's why I came up and I said, listen, at my time, it must be possible for people who want to go into uh, certain medical facilities or pharmaceutical facilities, or you want to go into agriculture, or you want to go into manufacturing, you must be able to raise finance, long-term finance. And here I'm saying 10 years finance with two years moratorium at single digit interest rate so that you can, after, after taking the finance, you can now focus on your business of manufacturing, whether it's in medicine, whether it's in agriculture, whether it's in pharmaceutical, 
That's what we seek to do. And that's what this country needs. Because once you make finance available, you have really unlocked unlocked some of the challenges that will fit, that people normally will face in setting up a credible and profitable business. Nobody wants to go into business and not make profit. That financing, cost of financing, is something that we felt we should deal with, and I'm happy today that we are dealing with it. Let's take a sidestep and cast our minds back to CACOVID, uh, the Coalition Against COVID-19. That private sector group of people was definitely in its from the outset, the idea was wonderful. The organized private sector coming together to help people who couldn't help themselves during this economic, this, this healthcare emergency. When you look at uh, CACOVID, I remember when we first met, actually the first time we spoke, it was on the grounds of the uh, healthcare center that you wanted to build in Yaba. And you made it clear that every single Naira that was donated would be accounted for. When you cast your mind back to then and, you know, to this, po- this moment of us speaking here, do you think that CACOVID served the purpose it was going to do? If we look at palliatives, I'm sure you saw those videos of you, CACOVID, handing over food to, to government and then them being hoarded. You would have seen that the healthcare centre in Yaba uh, was, went over budget, took a long, far longer time for it to be built. I understand that the, the theory behind it was wonderful, but are you proud of the practice? Are you proud of what was created thereafter. Let me tell you this. Eh? Kakovic is an initiative, a brilliant initiative of members of the private sector and the central bank and the bankers committee and remains so because indeed during the period of COVID, the real, at the ground, ground zero, what you can call ground zero of the COVID, when countries were locked down, we set up Kakovic. And I can tell you, after COVID, I have, I'm, I, I, maybe you can remind, you can let me, you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong. There's no country in the world where you found, where we saw private sector people coming together to say, listen, we must do something to help our weak people. We must do something to provide facilities where people who are affected by COVID-19 can get treated, right? No part of the world was this. So no regrets. And Kakuvi remains and will continue to remain a very potent force where private sector people can come together to support initiatives of government to help the people. So no regrets about it. Now, what did he do? Kakuvi was able to raise almost about 40 billion naira. Close to almost about 18 to 19 billion of that was used to build um, isolation centers in Yaba and in 36 states of the country, including FCT 37, right? We are happy that we did it and we, 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 the, the role or the, res, the, yeah, the objective for which it was set up, that was done, was achieved. Now, we also came out and said, look, listen, some people are, because of lockdown, some people are at home. Don't forget, at the initial stage of lockdown, people who were on daily wages were beginning to even begin to even, uh, the, the incidence of robbery or stealing was beginning to rear its head because people couldn't find money to feed themselves or to buy themselves food. And so Kakuvi said, listen, let us see what can be done. Kakuvi, some members of Kakuvi on their own private, on their own private accord went about even paying close to about 30 million naira on a weekly basis for bread to be distributed to people. Right? Now, again, Kakuvi said as a body, for those who are at home, but they want, they want to be able to feed their families and themselves, that let us make it possible. Buy rice, buy uh, sell more, all sorts of foodstuffs for them to, I mean, to, I mean, to be able to, do, for us to distribute to them, for them to be able to make, 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 make or, or any live, or sort of live, live, live well. And we spent almost close to about 22 to 23 billion naira doing that. We played our part. No regrets. Right? We, we knew that it was impossible for Kakovi. We didn't have the logistics to read the last mile. So we decided to collaborate with the state governors who had the structures with which we could read the last mile. So they insisted the food items had to be delivered to them to deliver to the last mile. We insisted that we work with them to get to the last mile. In some cases, yes, we were able to, to work with them. Some of the state governors worked with us to deliver to the, to the last mile. For some, 
Unfortunately and regrettably, it was not possible for us to, to work with them to deliver to last mile. So if that happened, still, there is no regret that we had COVID and COVID came out to do what it, it had as an objective to achieve. No regrets at all. Let's talk about COVID-19 vaccines. Nigeria is still heavily dependent on charity, as it were. Do you have any plans to make sure or to stop Nigeria being in a position where they are relying on handouts when it comes to still dealing with this virus? Well, you know, um, unfortunately, um, COVID really exposed the weaknesses in globalization. <laughs> you know, these days people are being talking about deglobalization. You can imagine a situation where some countries, developing countries in Africa, in other parts of the world, they have not been able to fully vaccinate their people. For instance, in Nigeria, with a population of over 200 million people, we can only just talk about maybe less than 4 million people being vaccinated, right? And yet, you find that some countries are talking about going for the third dose. It's such an unfortunate thing, but what do we do? I understand, of course, what does that mean? There's uh, 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 is it vaccine colonization. What does that also bring home? You have to think of yourselves. Do you understand? And yet, the economists will tell you you don't like the word protectionism, but we saw protectionism with COVID, right? And we saw that countries that were producing drugs held on to their drugs. In the same vein, countries who were producing vaccines held on to their vaccines to make sure that they deal with their people. People first, they get them vaccinated, give them third dose and possibly a fourth dose before they think about us. So it is a lesson to us that we need to really um, get up kick ourselves in the boat and begin to think about how do we help ourselves and do not wait for somebody to help you. For me, that's a lesson. Let's switch gears now and look at the Nigerian economy as a whole. As we approach the end of this year, of course, all eyes are on 2022. Let us start this part of the conversation with an economic outlook. What can we expect from next year? Um, let me say that um, if we look at the pre-COVID era, a few years before the, the COVID, the, uh, or after the 2016 2017 recession, the Nigerian economy had started to move up. The macroeconomic variables were looking very, very good. Growth was going, GDP was going out, up to the extent that uh, we closed 2019 at 2.55. We began 2020, 2021, 2020, first quarter at 1.87. But of course, COVID came on. Before COVID came on, reserves were looking good. Before COVID came on, we were able to moderate inflation from as high as 18.7% in January 2017 to as low as, as about 11% 11, 11 just before COVID came on. Came on. COVID, COVID came on and all the macroeconomic variables began to look, look south again. We took a number of actions, intervening, inter, intervening uh, policy actions. We have been able to recover ourselves. Growth now looking good. We are managing to see how to moderate inflation. Uh, luckily, results look good today. Luckily, we are beginning to see that there are high volumes, daily volumes on the IRE window, which is market, the dominant market for foreign exchange in Nigeria. I think it's looking good. And that is the reason that we in the Central Bank of Nigeria are projecting close to almost about 2.6% for close of 2021. But we think that if we continue to do some of the things that we did during the period of COVID and do more of them, we can only expect that the Nigerian economy is really truly ready, has opened up and ready to, to move on, a, on an aggressive growth trajectory. If there are some of the bad things we're doing that we stopped, then we need to stop them and just going to do what is right. And that brings us to what remains the focus. The current impetus for us at the Central Bank of Nigeria, working with the full support of President Muhammadu Buhari, is the infra infrastructure corporation. I feel gratified anytime he talks about 
the vision behind the infrastructure corporation because because funding or resolving the infrastructural deficit problem we have in Nigeria is a big issue and the fact that infrastructure corporation has been set up to deal with that from a, a what we call alternative and brilliant financial option i think it's something that we must embrace what that is doing is that it's supporting government effort in funding capex and infrastructure development in nigeria with that in place with what would government monetary and fiscal authorities are doing to re again reposition our manufacturing sector with what we're doing to reposition our agricultural sector again all i can say is that the future looks very good i am optimistic about it but not without challenges we still need to have our sleeves up work very hard to ensure that 2022 and almost remains good. We are talking about Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement area. Nigeria being the largest economy in Africa, Nigeria with the largest population in Africa must position itself to be a country that will not only provide for itself, but also provide for the rest of Africa, let alone the, part, the rest of the world. That should be the challenge. And that is what we should all work towards achieving because that is what will make me happy that we are beginning to to return nigeria back from where it was when i was born when it was good to where it is right now we need to take it even to a better place in your answer just then you mentioned that our foreign reserves are good what does that mean and i ask because you're well aware of the decisions to suspend the relationship the central bank had with bureau de change operators and the effect that's had on people, on the inflation rate. I, d I know that if we look at recent statistics, we know that six, there are six banks who have been able to reap the benefits, I'd, I'd, I'd assume, with, the, with this decision because they've been able to finance or directly service uh, foreign foreign exchange requests. But when you talk about our Forex reserves being good, how good are they? What does that mean? Nigeria's reserve at 42, almost 42, and we working hard to push it up, I still still say is good. Because even if we compare our reserves with South Africa, yes, at about 50 to 57 or something, or to Egypt, that is even 40, and people tell us, oh, look at what Egypt is doing, or look at what South Africa is doing. And I think if we're looking at that on a pair analysis, I think we're not doing badly. And that is why I say that our reserve levels are good. Let's look at, let's d dig a little deeper into, I guess, the macroeconomic side of this conversation. You're well aware of the recent comments from the Vice President, Yemi Osubajo, and concerns he may have had. Can you tell us, can you give us a bit more of an insight into how the Monetary Policy Committee are working with, or if they're working well with the fiscal policy, how, how does that relationship look like? How is that working? Well, um, and I'm sure if you ask the finance minister, or you ask, yeah, finance minister, uh, that we, um, um, I will use the word, we're always in contact with, he will tell, she will tell you that there are no issues about, um, the, about the relationship between the monetary and fiscal authorities. And um, when um, people come up and say, oh, there is no synergy, again, I wonder where that is coming from. However, let me say this. When COVID hit, Mr. President tasked the finance minister and I to work together to bring out some immediate response. And we, I went back to the banking community, to the bankers committee, and we came up with immediate response. And the minister of finance and I had opportunity several times to go back to brief the president. So it's left for you to respond whether there is collaboration between monetary and fiscal authorities there. Second, after that, the president said that we should establish the economic sustainability program group chaired by the vice president. The central bank played an active part in the development of, in development of that program to the extent that the fiscal authorities were only meant to contribute 500 billion and the monetary authorities were left to provide almost about 1.5 trillion naira. Please let me correct this. 
not as grants, but as loans to support people who were impacted by COVID-19 so they can get their business back. And I can tell you this, between, for, for, in, in 2020 alone, uh, between 2020 and now, our data shows that we have disbursed close to at least 2 trillion naira, almost 3 trillion naira in loans to households, to micro, small and medium enterprises, to our smallholder farmers, to our pharmaceuticals and health, health institutions, to our, uh, our, some of our large agricultural companies that want to, go, to get back again onto business, to manufacturing companies who are, who are accessing long-term 10 years loan with two years moratorium at single in single digit rate. So when I have the data that shows that we are playing our part at the, from the monetary side to support the program of government under the ESP. But if what people expect is that the central bank or monetary authority should hand the money over and give it to the fiscal, unfortunately, that is not the way it works. It's meant to be a loan, right? It's not meant to be delivered to, the, to any particular group in the fiscal to begin to share. It is meant to be a loan. And let's not forget, it was also an ingenuity on the part of central bank that we are saying that these are funds that are sequestered. This is not central bank money. This is not federal government money. These are funds sequestered from the cash reserve, cash reserve deposit of banks, which had to also go back through the banks to those that were lending monies to at 5% for 10 years with two years moratorium. So I think we're playing our part. When you say you think you're playing your part, that means that perhaps you think that the fiscal authorities aren't playing theirs? I have not said so. I have not said so. I said the Economic Sustainability Program came up and said federal as the fiscal will provide 500 billion. But monetary will fund close to about 1.5 trillion. And I have said that data shows that we've done over 2 trillion. That's what I mean that we have played our part. Our job is to complement, right? And I believe we're doing, doing some, some good job. And that is why at every opportunity when we hold our monetary policy committee meetings, we've always taken the pain to read out what we have done to complement the efforts of the fiscal. And the data is there. And as long as I'm governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, we will continue to make this data available to Nigerians. But I'm saying, and I repeat myself, honestly, in my entire career as a banker, I, I have never seen where banks, whether they are compelled or through moral solution, where they would lend 10-year money with two years moratorium at single-digit interest rates. I have never seen it. And I'm just praying, even after I've left CBN, that this will continue. Let us talk about the 100 for 100 program, that policy. What does it seek to do and how is that supposed to work? I know it would have just been in its early stages, uh, but talk to us more about what that program seeks to do. Again, the 100 for 100 program is another program that came up out of the need to say that we must support we must do everything to create employment for our people, right? And that's why if you read that, the framework we said, employment must be, we must see measurable level of employment that will, provide, that will be provided by that project. There have to be new projects. There have to be projects where even the central bank will do everything possible to provide foreign exchange to import plants and machinery. And they have to project where, by the time the plant or machineries are set up, raw material content, import content of raw material will be near zero, right? So that we can begin to look at, we can begin to turn our eyes at our own available local raw materials rather than importing them. So as long as we find them, so those, so, so, so those are some of the issues around that we felt 
it is meant again to complement what the Mr. President said that we had to create 10 million jobs in 10 years. That is something that we are saying we need to work towards. And it will help to reduce the level of unemployment. It will make credit available at cheap rates and it will make credit available for a long tenure. You also mentioned that in terms of the prerequisites, at least 80% of the employees within these new companies, entities would have to be Nigerian. Uh, again, what is the central bank going to do to make sure that these companies actually meet those requirements and not just, I guess, come, come towards you with your, their hands open and then go ahead and turn their backs around on those promises once they got the support that they're looking for? We, we know that people would like to play some games about it. But I can assure you that Central Bank has the resources to monitor. Even our current intervention programs, whether in agriculture or in manufacturing, those people who have accessed those facilities will tell you that at least twice a year, our people go to check to investigate, to conduct some kind of um, investigation to know whether those projects are being set up, whether they are meeting the objectives. So um, I, I don't want to say that, there will, there will be, uh, that we will not have a few misses, but I, I can assure you they will be monitored, and that is the reason. We're very clear again. We said we will advertise. We will advertise it, we will scrutinize it, we will monitor it so that Nigerians truly know. So that if, for instance, you took money, Right, and you are not. It's not within the objective. Nigerians who are going to read your name on the page of the newspaper will say, "No, this man didn't do the right thing." That is. Those are some of the uh, what I call self censorship programs that have to be put in place because we need to truly be very truthful and honest, adopt the best level of governance in programs like this that is meant to create jobs, reduce unemployment, and indeed help to even reduce the level of insecurity in our country. We don't have a choice. We, have, we owe our people that God has put us in a position, right? It is, it is providence that is put, cast on us to, to fend for the people, to provide, to put in place policies that will improve the lives of our people. And I dare say, we as leaders don't have a choice. We must do what is expected of us. Thank you. If we take a few steps back to our conversation about foreign reserves, you, of course, I mean, these directives came from you when it comes to accessing uh, foreign currency. There are certain prerequisites people need to meet if they're traveling for personal or business travel, if they want to pay educational school fees abroad. If we look at that school fees abroad issue, it was very clear that they had to be tertiary institutions only. But then that, of course, leaves some people behind. There are parents in Nigeria who send their children abroad for secondary school. And because of that, they don't meet that re requirement that you've set. What happens to them and their desires to access foreign reserves for their own families? Me, let me tell you this. Again, I go back to what I, what I said about what Nigeria was, educational Nigeria's education was. When I was born, I was born in Nigeria. I went to primary school in Nigeria. I did my secondary school in Nigeria, my university in Nigeria. Indeed, people were coming from other parts of the world to attend universities in Nigeria. What has happened that we will now begin to think about our children going to school, secondary school abroad? I think um, if I'm sorry to put it, I, mean, I can't, you know, this is not about a popularity contest. It's about the fact that if you can afford it, good for you. But I wish I had the opportunity. I think what we should be doing is to improve our level of our educational standards, our educational institutions so that people can go to secondary school in Nigeria. And when we begin to achieve that, right, then I will begin to think that Nigeria is coming back to the Nigeria of my birth. I am sorry, I may not have answered your question the way you want it, but this is the truth. We started this conversation with you highlighting your successes, the, the moments that you're proud of. Uh, as human beings, there are failures that we all experience and I want to ask you what yours are and how you feel you've been able to overcome them if at all. Well as human beings you make mistakes but I think what is important is that you learn from those mistakes and move on right 
And I believe that um, there are a couple of mistakes that have been made. The fact that we learn from those mistakes and are ready to move on. For, for, for me, I think it's, it's something that is good. Okay, and, and based on that, I'd like to say that for the remaining part of the two years, we will try to make sure and make sure that those, those mistakes don't happen again. But I think what is important is that the remaining two and a half years that we have on this job, that will make the best of it, will deliver the best to Nigeria and to Nigerians. We will make sure that our programs that we want to focus on, on infrastructure, on infraco, or the Nigerian International Financial Center are projects that are legacy projects that by the time we sit back after we have left this job and we see doing well, we say, thank God we had an opportunity to serve our country. When we cast our minds forward two years towards the end of your time in this job, what is the Nigeria you want to leave behind? We've spoken so much during this conversation about your historical affinity to Nigeria and how it was in your childhood and how unfortunately that hasn't continued to be the case throughout your life. With this job coming to an end for you in the next two years, if we were to look, I, I, I don't want it to, to be too utopian or to look at it as a paradise, but what is the Nigeria you want to have left behind? I just dream again about Nigeria of my youth, my Nigeria of my childhood, what it was then what it is now and i'm praying that with whatever we would have done while in office that nigeria could if nigeria could just return or move close close to what we were during our birth or our childhood then i can sit back and say thank god that um, we left something for our children my own 90 year old son all he sees is what Nigeria is today. He didn't, he, he didn't see Nigeria when of my birth. And that's why I would be happy by the time I leave office and we are handing over to the next generation, Nigeria can look like those countries, Nigeria of our birth and of our youth. Creative industries, manufacturing, agriculture, where do you think Nigeria's greatest moneymaker will be? Where, would, where do you think, what sector do you think that will come from? Listen, Nigeria, the Nigeria is, is a country with immense opportunities. Is it in the creative industry? Is it in the agriculture? Is it in the manufacturing? Nigeria is a leader. Is it in tech? Do you understand? It's a country with immense opportunities. So I do not want to just mention one particular sector, given the fact that, you know, population is growing. We, still have, we have a lot to give to our people. All I can say is that it is time for Nigeria to stop relying on a country or economy dependent on oil. We must diversify with the economy into the non-oil sectors of our economy. We must deepen our economy so that we can truly position ourselves as a country that is self-sufficient. Self-sufficiency has to do with what we talk about in economics of import substitution industrialization, pro produce to feed yourself. Then you begin to talk about produce, feed yourself, and then export. That would be a country that I dream about. And I pray that this happens in our lifetime. When we look back at your 100 for 100 program, the, the policy, what do you expect the outcomes to be? What can we expect the outcomes will be? The basic, we want to see, we seek that through this 100 for 100 program, we can create employment for our people. With this 100 for 100 program, we can have a situation where instead of importing right items, you can produce them in the country and stop exporting our jobs. Let's create jobs for our people. Let's grow our country. Nigeria is one of the very few in, few in the world where we are not self-sufficiency in almost everything and we must turn this situation around. When we look at the support given from, by the Central Bank of Nigeria to uh, different institutions when it came to dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, there are, of course, SMEs, MSMEs. Uh, what type of support did you give them and have those investments, have those loans come good? Okay. Now, like we said, 
during the period of COVID, people were impacted. Their livelihoods were badly impacted. So we looked at households. We looked at micro, small and medium enterprise businesses. And we said, what do they need to start livelihood again, to begin to earn a livelihood? Some we gave through our intervention, 500,000, some 750,000. Some of the highest was about 1 million to 1.5 million. And so far we've disbursed almost close to about 300 billion of that to, to slightly over a million of them. And let me tell you, when you talk about its impact, what we, what we sought to achieve with that is to catalyze consumption and investment expenditure. If you understand the formula of GDP, is consumption plus investment plus government expenditure plus export minus imports, right? And if you look at that computation, consumption and investment expenditure will con constitute close to almost about 60% of that computation for you to really see the impact. So I can say that from what we've done, right, impacting households, small and medium enterprises, this was and indeed, I would say, one of those primary factors responsible for turning Nigeria's recession after two quarters, after two quarters of recession into positive output. And I think we're happy that this is happening. If I have my way, we would continue. 2023, without a doubt, is going to be a momentous year for many reasons, but definitely because of the presidential election. I want to ask you, who do you think will be the person to take Nigeria to the next level? Who do you think the person will be? What, what qualities would that person need to have to allow Nigeria to finally reach its potential? Who do you think that person should be? Well, thank you very much. I like the use of the word momentous. Indeed, I will agree with you. It is going to be a momentous time for Nigeria. However, I am a banker. I am not a politician. I am a technocrat. But I think Nigerians are smart enough to think about the best persons that is good. But I would just like to be allowed to focus on the remaining two to two and a half years of how to deliver a good monetary policy, right? And a good economy with all my, with my team that I'm very grateful to. I think once we're able to do that, I'll be happy.